Samuel Konkin III, SEK3, on Rayo and Vanu. Different approaches? Narrator's note. Four articles by Samuel Konkin will be referenced in this article. Visit vanupodcast.com to view them, and you can also pick up Rayo's book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, for free in PDF and audiobook format. If you were a libertarian anarchist in the 1960s and 70s, Southern California was the place to be. This bustling community was home to many ideological figures who largely developed the theory and practice of modern libertarian anarchist thought. Two gentlemen, specifically Rayo, a.k.a. El Rayo, and Samuel Conkin III, SEK3, also called this place home for at least some time, although they never crossed paths. Rayo is lesser known for his development of Vanu, and SEK3 is now well known for his strategy called Agorism. Vanu, simply defined, is the hardening of one's lifestyle to such an extent that an individual could be said to have rendered himself nearly invulnerable to coercion. Vanu itself is an awkward contraction of the phrase, voluntary, not vulnerable. This invulnerability from coercion could be defense from public coercers, governments, or private coercers, criminals. Agorism, on the other hand, is a revolutionary market anarchist strategy that advocates the goal of bringing about a society in which all relations between people are voluntary exchanges by means of counter-economics, which is black and gray market trading. That is, trafficking in products and services which are either illegal or unregulated and untaxed, but not immoral or unethical. To put it another way, Vanu is defensive, whereas Agorism is offensive. Much like a duality, they could be used together to mutually reinforce each other, not entirely dissimilar to a two-parent household composed of mommy and daddy. Before diving into what SEK3 had to say about Rayo and Vanu, let's first compare and contrast the two individuals. First, both were wholly apolitical, even anti-political. Rayo chose to not participate in politics and went so far as to coin the terms political crusading and bullshit libertarianism. Mainstream politics itself is collective, and Rayo had a term for that too, collective movementism, which he was also against. From his other idea of controlled schizophrenia found in his book, it's safe to conclude that he would clump the political crusaders under that label as well. SEK3 was against political crusading as he viewed it as an inconsistent application of means and ends. In New Libertarian Manifesto, he said, quote, Worst of all is partyarchy, the anti-concept of pursuing libertarian ends through statist means, especially political parties. End quote. That can be found in page 7. As far as why they both opposed this anti-strategy, they were very much in line. Secondly, they were both freedom pioneers and developers of strategies that were outside of the political sphere. They differed in approach, but we'll get to that in a moment. To keep this brief, the last important commonality is that they both saw the advantages of trading in the black and gray markets. In November 1965, when SEK3 would have been 18 years old, Rayo published an article on Innovator titled Self-Seeking Ethical Enclave, Black Markets. He defined this concept as, quote, An ethical enclave is defined here as voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when such transactions are conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristic of the participating individuals, an adherence to the ethical principle of voluntarism, and enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society, end quote. Sounds awfully similar to agorism, right? More on this later. You're going to want to keep listening. So where did these two individuals differ? To start with ideology first, Rayo was not an anarchist. Unfortunately, as we discovered in one of his articles, he saw all anarchists as folks who use retaliatory force against their rulers. From the articles that will be discussed momentarily, we also learned that the individuals in the Free Isles Project agreed upon a nominal state. Konkin, on the other hand, was an openly avowed anarchist. Nothing else needs to be said on that note. Next, they differed in strategy. Rayo's interfacing with the public was in the form of newsletters and other such publications. As can be ascertained from his book, he didn't have a whole lot of patience for folks and was more of a hermit. SEK3 was quite a bit different, though. Not only did he openly admit that he didn't pay taxes in a debate with Robert Poole, but he had much more of a public presence. He spoke at conferences, wrote books, and pursued culture jamming efforts, such as the Counter Campaign 76. It's safe to say that these two individuals' approaches vary drastically on this point. Lastly, Rayo saw mobility as being crucial. He lived as a van nomad for a while and then pursued wilderness Vanu, both methods containing the option to pick up and leave quickly. 
He also discussed country shopping and minimalist sailboating, which are more evocative of Hakeem Bey's idea of temporary autonomous zones rather than a fixed geographical locale. SEK3 was different. As we will get to momentarily, he had some disparaging things to say about Vonuus. In one article, he wrote, quote, As for me, anarchy begins at home, end quote. His goal was to recruit individuals to practice in the counter-economy, and he felt like that was best done through face-to-face -face discussions and conferences. He also believed that doing so in a permanent or semi-permanent location was most efficacious, rather than living as a nomad or retreating, as he would put it. All of that said, I'd like to tie up one loose end before moving forward. In passing, I mentioned and defined Rayo's concept known as ethical enclaves, which is strikingly similar to that of SEK3's agorism. I initially posited in Vanu podcast number one, an introduction to Vanu, that it is reasonable to believe Rayo had some sort of an impact on SEK3's formulation of agorism. That said, the day of recording this episode, there was no hard evidence of that, let alone any evidence that SEK3 was even aware of this pseudonymous individual named Rayo. Now I got a wild hair and decided to scour the interwebs for any possible connection. Aha! There they were. From January to June 1975, SEK3 published four articles in the Southern Libertarian Review, mostly in the vein of now-libertarian history, as well as some details on the formation of the anti-libertarian Libertarian Party all referencing Rayo and or Vanu specifically. Number one. In his article titled Anarcho-Zionism, he discusses the earlier referenced Free Isles project and goes into some detail about how it came about. SEK3 said, quote, The preformed crowd either browned out or went into escapist trips, such as becoming nomads, troglodytes, or wilderness dwellers. They sought invulnerability to coercion, or Vanu, and preform inform became Vanu life. Recently, it sputtered to a halt, and the paranoia freaks drifted back to civilization, end quote. From that, we can gather that SDK3 was familiar with the Vanuans and their goals, likely from the publications themselves. As can be seen, his perception of them was quite gloomy, to say the least. Number two. He published another article in March of 1975 titled Carrots and Sticks, wherein he highlights the achievements of various individuals he's fond of and recommends. He gets to a portion of folks that he is not so familiar with. Quote, Before I leave Southern California, let me not slight anyone, but simply affirm that there are many libertarians I know well enough to exalt, but who have not the general fame for their less persistent endeavors, generally due to working for a living, an affliction found rarely on the East Coast. And there are others of fame that do not enjoy my personal knowledge, such as Joe Galambos, Natalie Hall, and Sky Diorios, El Rayo and Naomi Gatherer, and Lou Rollins, whose good and worthy efforts will someday earn them a more adept chronicler. End quote. At the Vani podcast, our conception of Rayo during the 1960s and 70s is that he was not very well known. It seems like he was part of an extremely niche crowd, and if he enjoyed fame, it was not by the popular definition. That being said, the way SEK3 phrases that last portion is interesting. Is it possible that Rayo was more popular than we originally assumed? Were? Or are there more Vanuans than we assume there to be? Also, have we been wrong in claiming that Rayo's freemate's name was Roberta, and rather it was Naomi? Was that the pseudonym beneath another pseudonym that she provided Benjamin Best? A little less significant, sure, but with the sparse information available, unfortunately, I don't think we are the adept chroniclers that SEK3 was referring to. Number three. For those who are deeply interested in libertarian history, SEK3's article, Libertarian Strategy 1, may be of interest to you. Herein, there are two different mentions of Vanu, specifically publications. Here's what he had to say, quote, So that we are not condemned to relive it, let's review our history. As of December 1968, libertarian strategy was directed either toward influence of the conservatives or conversion of the independents. It was wholly educational or retreatist. Robert Lefebvre's Rampart College, Leonard Reed's Fee, Joe Galambos's FEI, Nathaniel Brandon's NBI, F.A. Harper's IHS and Frank Shadorov's ISI were all educational institutes. The Vanu Lifers, Atlantis Group, and Oliverites were seeking escape. Except for the liberal innovators' leafleting of the Cow Palace in 1964, no libertarians were involved in the political campaign except as deviationist individuals. Many supported Nixon in 1968, but they were clearly of conservative leanings. Many libertarians also turned inward with incessant psychology sessions and in-group self-criticism. This was the movement as reflected in 1972 in, say, New Libertarian Notes, and which could be pieced together from Rap, Libertarian Forum, Reason, Academic Associates Letter, 
Freeman, SIL News, Pacific Libertarian, and many local newsletters, end quote. Regarding the first quote, SEK3 is quite accurate in stating that Vanu lifers were seeking escape. Although Rayo does discuss Vanu in cities, he notes that, quote, I know of quite a few Vanuists and Libertarians who live Alan Humble's way, but I know none who seem to like it for very long, end quote. This is mainly due to the city psychological pressures of the status of all society, which is why he prefers, quote, to live far enough back in the woods, end quote. Other than that minor points, SEK3 is correct. The second excerpt is particularly interesting, though. Unfortunately, the only Vanu Life articles I have read are those found within Rayo's book. From that, I certainly don't gather the incessant psychology sessions or in-group self-criticism. Rather, from the entirety of the book, it mainly consists of back-and-forth discussions on strategy, much like a forum or fascist book thread. I'm not sure what SEK3 is referring to here, but it's definitely possible that he's correct. Until we acquire a library of those publications, we'll just have to take his word for it. Number four. This last article discusses Counter Campaign 76, which was a culture jamming effort encouraging people to vote for nobody, much like the one that took form this most recent election cycle. Sarcastically, SEK3 writes, quote, And who could we all agree on without sacrificing our principles? Behind whom could students of Murray Rothbard, Robert Lefebvre, Ayn Rand, Leonard Reed, Joseph Galambos, Carl Hess, Robert A. Heinlein, El Rayo, Natalie Hall, and Harry Brown unite? Nobody. End quote. On a slight tangent, it's pretty cool to see Rayo's name alongside Rothbard, Rands, and Hess's. SEK3 is definitely right, though. Sure, a similar foundation of principles was adhered to by most of these folks, but the minor differences weren't as minor as would be perceived by the casual statist observer. The only solution is nobody. So what's the takeaway? Number one. SEK3 was familiar with Rayo, even if only through the various publications they both read or contributed to. Number two, agorism was likely developed based upon Rayo's formulation of ethical enclaves. Number three, they differed in strategy and were both particularly harsh towards those they disagreed with. That said, they were more alike than not. And number four, the history of libertarianism, even within the last 40 years, is chock full of fascinating details. In closing, we believe that Vanu and agorism go hand in hand and offer an extremely powerful solution to the institutionalized coercion brought about by the state, as well as the non-institutionalized coercion brought about by those private criminal syndicates. Hell, Rayo even included ethical enclaves, trading in the black and gray markets, as a potential option for Vanuans, but more so in pursuing financial independence and tax minimization, rather than the revolutionary agorism set out by SEK3 as a means of abolishing the state. Because remember, Vanuans are more than happy to coexist in protracted conflict with the state. Sure, there are differences, but we are all individuals. That is the beauty of Vanu. It is truly yours for the making. You've just heard Samuel Konkin III, SEK3 on Rayo and Vanu, different approaches, originally found at vanupodcast.com. For more information, please check out the Vanu podcast, and please share this around, post it on your blogs, talk about it on your podcast, etc.